like for Charles or what? Introduction music like allows Instagram time for better at music. What? Huh? What'd you say? I wish my Instagram handle was better. I'd use it. Roaming versatiles? Yeah. That's not terrible. That's not terrible. Yeah, it I thought you were cat the dog trainer, It's it's no guy with the pink gun. Or cat the dog trainer. Are we recording? Ooh, we are. Just so you know, for any amount of, I'll start taking offers to tell the origin story of the pink gun. <laughs> but I'm gonna need some serious offers. Don't play with me. <laughs> uh, you know, and honestly, you are probably one of the few people that does actually know. For there's three in the whole world, and they're right one, two, three. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> it's a closely guarded secret. Yeah, and I hold the dollar, so... <laughs> he does. He still has it in his wallet. I know. The dollar's important. Not okay. a dollar. The, the dollar. dollar. The dollar. Welcome back, guys, to another episode of Yawa. This is part two this week. We have our guests, Annie and Charles, and I'm doing the introduction this time because I do a better job than Kat. <clears throat> Throw it in the comments <laughs> below. What do you think? Is Kat or I better at introducing... This series. Well, we don't have to guess who's better at reading the questions. No, no contest. No contest. Definitely me. Ethan can't even I read can't a read. three sentence question without stumbling. So we're going to start <laughs> answering questions. There was definitely a theme with the questions this time. And we got so many great questions, probably at least 80 questions. So we tried to categorize them a yes. little bit. I want to I want to preface that. Just real quick He's here. He's back on interrupting um, you. Yeah, interrupting. No, the interrupting, interrupting cat. Knock knock. Who's there? Interrupting cat. Interrupting cow. Um, you've not heard this joke. <laughs> I've heard this joke. Okay, we got to tell Annie. Oh. Knock knock. Who's there? Interrupting cow. Interrupting cow. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey. So all I'm getting at is that you. we really appreciate y'all. We appreciate the fact that you have questions and you feel comfortable and want to reach out to us. And we apologize for not being able to answer all of them. But we do want you to know that the reason why we don't get to all of them is because there literally were 80 questions this week. So we will continue to try and move through them. As Go, Cat. Through Cat. Okay. So like I was saying before, I was so rudely mood and interrupted by the interrupting cow over here. Wow. We had a very thematic number of questions about e-collars. And so we're going to kind of try and answer Lot, most, lots and lots of, most of these questions about e-collars in this episode. So first question from Eno, the GSP on Instagram. Help. Our GSP is great during recall training, but when another dog walks by, he doesn't listen. Okay. So that is, I mean, without sounding short or rude or anything else that's it's a pretty good idea that you're not finished with collar conditioning and maybe you haven't even started because you just said recall training maybe you've done mostly positive based recall training and that is really good in controlled environments when your puppy wants to work your dog wants to work for that treat when the treat has a higher value than what they want to do which is um, in those higher distracting situations typically sniffing something else playing with the other dog running off those things, if you're only doing positive-based training with treats as rewards, uh, those things are typically more important to the dog in those situations than that little treat that you've got, even when you're out there shaking your little bag of treats. Come on, Fido, please come back. They're like, meh, birds, rabbits, squirrels, outside, I don't care. And Other for, dogs, it looks like. For all of you, all positivers out there, we understand also that if we are shaking bags of treats, we're not doing our positive reinforcement training properly. Yes, we know that. <laughs> but I believe that that's a pretty common thing that a lot of people resort to as if that is positive training, that they get the treat bag out. We're just and baiting and bribing it. at that point. Yes. I'm not going to lie. I've done it before. Oh, I think well, we I all I think we've have. all done it at some point in time. It's but like, it doesn't <laughs> always work. And dip. That's because the reason that it doesn't work is because that treat, that bowl of food, that whatever, that bait isn't of a high enough value to pull the dog's focus back to us. So whether you've started with collar conditioning or not, that would be our recommendation of using collar conditioning to recall. 
um, to be able to reinforce that recall training in those higher distracting situations. Uh, but you can't just throw a collar on a dog and push the button and think that they're going to come back. You have to do the training it's to get It's a great way to ruin things. Yes. And you also can't do it in the hallway and then roll right to the dog park and expect your dog to come running to you from the pack of dogs either. Uh, so there, there's a... A proofing process. Right. There's a stepping up, to, especially when you're dealing with distractions. Definitely when you're dealing with distractions, which actually leads us into our next question. I'm going to, these are really great questions and they're very relatable. So I'm going to use them to segue into the next one easily from R underscore college 05 on Instagram, e-collar training, how to start, when to vibrate versus stim. Typically when we're starting to introduce any of our new cues that they've already learned through positive reinforcement, we're going to start vibrate conditioning those behaviors, whether it's for recall, it's for place training. We can use vibrate in those controlled situations because vibrate's typically enough. Then we need to be able to transition to using actual stimulation also in those controlled environments when the dog is focused so that they can also understand that the stimulation, the continuous stimulation means the same thing. It's shut off the same way as vibrate by complying with what we're asking them to do, which is something they already know how to do. Then we can start using a little bit more stimulation until we're sure that we're getting a direct response based on that stimulation in those controlled situations so that when we need more stimulation in those high distraction situations, it's available. And, and, all, it, and the dog's going to respond properly. And it's all proof. You don't, you don't do vibrate, do a one continuous, and then again, just step it up. You, you're slowly working up. You're building a up. A conditioning process for right. everything. Yep. And um, I also want to mention that you can't just say, well, this is the level that my dog always responds to because it's not the same. The situation, uh, even the environment, temperature, and humidity is going to change how that collar connects with the dog, how they respond to the collar. Even the dog's mental... Um, level of exhaustion or focus is going to change how they react to the collar and what level they're going to respond to in any sure. given situation. Um, that outside stimulus of distractions, other dogs, birds, things like that are going to be a huge distraction to those dogs and different levels are going to be necessary to get through those distractions. Was that one when to start too? Um, how to start and when to use vibrate versus stem. Okay. So okay. we say when to use one versus the other. Basically, um, once you've proofed the collar and they understand that those levels of stimulation, higher levels of stimulation, if necessary, mean the same thing as vibrate, we can say, I'm going to try and get my dog to respond with vibrate. But I know when they're chasing a bird that that's not going to cut it. And so I know that at those times I'm going to need stimulation. We always use the lowest level of stimulation necessary to get the desired response. Um, but don't go into it thinking, I'm going to give him, you know, if you know your dog doesn't listen, ch say you're hunting and the dog's chasing Yeah, don't just bird. try vibrate. Don't try first. vibrate. You know it's not going to work. It, it, it's That's just, where I made the mistake with the vibrate and beeper collar with my dog, Nix. We talked about this, about <laughs> the biggest mistakes we've ever made training. So check out that Yawa video if you want to hear that story. I made a mistake. I know it's hard to believe. It really is. Um, but Ethan also made a mistake and talked about it in that video. So Whoa. that's easier to believe. Ah. I saved it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the other side of it, I think, that comes into is the difference between the two. I mean, and when to use them. I've actually heard from some other trainers that don't primarily work with sporting breeds like we do. We, I mean, there's a, a husky in our kennel, but that would even still be considered a sporting breed, just not a a, bird, work, a working a dog, working maybe. breed. Yeah, working. Um, yep. <laughs> but we just had a dachshund and a chug, a chihuahua pug mix. In for some um, obedience training. In for training. some yep. obedience training. And I maybe the dachshund could be potentially considered like a hunting working dog way back when. Um, but um, definitely, They still do some. But. Some, yeah. This one not, um, yeah, for not sure. Yeah. But the chug, definitely mm, not. Nope, just nope. a designer just breed, obedience dogs. I mean, but the, so I've heard that the, um, the vibrate can be more aversive than actual stimulation. And it's usually our go-to because it's typically not with our dogs. Our dogs have, um, you know, a higher level of drive or desire and it becomes a really 
low pressure, light, easy way to communicate you know, with the dog, communicate with the dog and build conditioning around a behavior. And it says, Hey, focus in these low distraction situations. It's enough to pull them as a, you know, almost a cue in itself to say, Hey, redirect their focus, make them make sure we've got their attention when we're giving them that cue uh, so they can pay attention to it, pull their focus back to the training situation and us and the vibrate, not only can they feel it, but they can also hear that buzzing near their ear. If you grab a collar and you press the vibrate, you can hear it vibrating as well as feel it. And if it's right up on their neck by their ear, those dogs can definitely hear it as well. So it's able to utilize two senses yep. in this conditioning process. But then we utilize the e-collar to redirect focus. Typically in our program with the dogs we're working with, if I have a dog that I ask to do something and we try and use vibrate first, maybe not in that situation where we know they're not going to respond, but we use vibrate first and then they aren't responding to that because their, their focus is pulled toward a bird or something to sniff or whatever is more important to them at the time. We will find that lowest level of stimulation that's going to pull their focus back. And then we'll go back to typically using vibrate to say, all right, now complete this that you already know. Yeah, and just remember that. So this is, you can avoid that stimulation that may have been slightly uncomfortable by just complying to vibrate. And also for you as the trainer, remember that when I'm in this situation, especially if you tried vibrate and you had to go to stimulation, remember in that situation that vibrate's not going to work. And I hear so many people that say, well, I'm going to use tone or I'm going to try to get there. I'm going to warn them first or something like that. Or and I'm going to ask them first. And if they don't listen, then I'll, then I'll use the collar or do, or, and especially if they use the collar in the wrong way. So it, it just, as the trainer, remember that, that, you know, when I'm hunting in the field, my dog just doesn't vibrate, doesn't work, you know, it's because for certain dogs. anything that you're doing with your dog consistently, they're being conditioned to. So if, you first try vibrate and they just blow it off. Exactly. They're conditioning themselves to understand that I can just ignore vibrate. I don't have to listen. And then the real, you know, and when that happens in the happens. field, that's when you're, so they also understand the environment that they're in and they say, Oh, when we're oh, out sure. hunting, he vibrates me. Then he yells a little bit. Oh, then he nicks me. Oh, now I better go. Yep. And so now it turns into vibrate, yell, That nick. has to be the cycle every time. Right. And, so and they're waiting for it. Right. So just as the trainer, remember that and say, oh, yeah, vibrate doesn't work. And just go to the stimulation level that gets the response that you need And I think that, that what environment. Ethan was mentioning is once you get their attention focused and back, a lot of times you can switch back to vibrate then once mm -hmm. you've redirected their focus and complete the task with that vibrate instead of completing the task at those higher levels of stimulation, which were necessary to pull your dog's focus back to you, but not necessarily necessary for them to complete the task. We actually saw that very recently in training, working with a dog here that has a lot of prey drive and desire, specifically around retrieving. And it was one of those things that he went out to make a retrieve and picked it up and was trying to shop basically or go. There were multiple bumpers or multiple opportunities and he was trying to pick up multiple of them. And even with singles out there, he's running out, he's grabbing it and he's trying to do this like parade loop. Well, when we hit vibrate with that specific dog like you were talking about, um, he would kind of continue that parade and he's ignoring it. So it took a higher level of stimulation. Now, as soon as you pulled his focus back, if you stayed with that, it, and it took a little bit higher level of stimulation to get that focus, if you stayed on that level, it was too much because now that you have his focus, he's no longer overtaken. Distracted. Yeah, distracted and overtaken by the, the drive and desire to go make the retrieve. So being able to switch back to vibrate was able to make a very consistent situation there. So he would go out, you could pull focus back with stimulation, and then switch to vibrate because if you stayed with stem it was too much and you would end up dropping the bumper or, or something else would happen but if you stayed on vibrate he would end up making a, a almost perfect straight back recall with the retreat once so you got his focus pulled back to being making able that to, recall yeah happen. being able to use both can be very beneficial yes um yeah i mean they've people have said that the one of the greatest inventions in dog training was the variable stimulation collar so don't feel like that it's an on off button Use, yeah. use all of the, yes. you, there's a reason that it has vibrate and in DT's case, 16 levels, use them. Yes. Don't, don't feel like you're stuck in one little box. Yes, for sure. 
Uh, that was a really great way that you were talking about the um, other obedience-based only dogs using collar conditioning because we had a question actually from Eric Malfaro on Instagram. Would you recommend using an e-collar on a dog you don't plan on hunting with? Yes, definitely. Yes. Um, obedience training is one of the things that we reinforce with the e-collars almost more than the hunting stuff because I'm not necessarily – um, reinforcing in the beginning stages, dogs learning to point. I mean, that's all natural. So uh, when we get into the more advanced stuff with formal woe training and collar conditioning to woe, which we've got a whole series coming out with Legend, um, part two was just released recently, and part yep. three will be out next weekend. Um, but in the beginning stages, we're not collar conditioning those dogs to do those things. It's the obedience side of the training that we're collar conditioning the recall, the healing, the place training. Those recall, 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 recall. Recall is super important if you can tell. Most people, they're e- even people I know, friends, you know, people that I help with their dogs that just have pets, recall. If the dog will come back to you, it solves a lot of problems. A lot of problems. Yes. Now, it makes your life so much more fun. And, and you can do so many more things with your dog when you have a solid and it's enjoyable. recall. You can go to the park and you know you can throw the ball and. You don't. You, you can call the dog and it will come back to you. There's a huge difference, though, and I want to point out this difference in having a solid understanding of recall and having a dog that is apprehensive of the collar and runs back to you. Yes. And that is the biggest mistake that I think that people say or I hear from people is, yeah, this collar is magic, and they are legitimately believe that the collar is magic, not magic, but... It's awesome because it instantly fixed their problem of their dog would not come back to him. Because that's the thing. It's like, I got a collar because my dog didn't listen to him come back to me. Well, I just shocked him and then they came back to me. Well, fear response. It was a fear response, you know, and you could get both. I think it's a pretty common one for dogs to feel apprehensive and then cling to their owners or they're cling to the situation that makes them feel more comfortable out of time, their owners. But the other response you could have in that situation is they run the other they way. They bolt. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then they're gone. And... Um, because we can use the e-collar as such a powerful training tool that's not only necessary for recall, but can be used for place training and healing, those things aren't going to be magically fixed by just pushing the button. Uh, the dog needs the training and needs the understanding of the collar, which you are really good at segueing me into my next question. It's like he knows me or something. So I do what I can. The next question is also from Instagram. Jansen.Anthony. If I mess that up, it's because my circle circled the name a little bit. Love Yawa. Yay. Especially right now, training a new GSP. Question for you guys is that our new GSP is petrified of the collar, which is what we were just kind of talking Uh about. Even when it's out with one of the other dogs, she cowers and runs to the kennel. She's still young, 15 weeks, and we have only introduced it to her once. How do we get her more comfortable and where do we go from here? So I have to say that you are not alone in this. And we have seen a ton of questions about dogs being apprehensive to... Or startled, at least at the minimum, by their collar. Yep. And I think that most people are following along with what we are saying, which is typically getting a collar that has a vibrate setting and using that as their basic introduction And that is what brought me up to what I'd heard in the past, which I have not personally experienced it as the majority, but it definitely sounds like the people that are at least reaching out to us are having some issues. And I think that um, I'm going to say a couple different things with this, one of which is if you are trying to work through Vibrate and your dog has this uh, bad response or negative response in your first introduction to the collar, I, I have to say that there are some stability issues that need to be worked by, through as well. A dog that is that easily startled by something as small as the vibrating box on their neck, we probably need to do some other things that involve a little bit more socialization. And building a bolder, confident dog, yes. developing that dog so that simple things like the vibrate, and then potentially if you're looking at hunting, um, that gunfire introduction, when it comes time to do that, isn't going to be as big of a situation for that dog. And the next part of that could be that um, not all dogs fit in the same cookie cutter. And that is a big thing that we... 
Yes. Uh, time frame is another 15 part of weeks it. for that dog may be too young. And it may be better to work on um, something with a long line or positive reinforcement and then maybe come back to it. it it's hard to say without knowing the dog. Without knowing it a can, little bit. It can more definitely detail. be, I mean, 15 weeks is, you know, we, 14, 15 weeks is generally when I think we all start it. But that's not right for every dog. And that's no. why when people are like, I want a step-by-step plan of what age I do what things with my dog. We're really hesitant to write that. Yeah, and we're working on that right now of this lesson plan of the averages of typically you can start this now and go to this next step then and giving ages. But A, if you haven't done all the groundwork, the ages aren't going to matter. And B, like Charles was saying, not every dog is ready for that level of training at those certain times, dogs right. are slower to mature. Some breeds are slower to mature. And if you just get caught up with an age of, well, you know, Standing Stone Kennels, their lesson plan here recommends starting collar conditioning to recall or place training from 12 to 16 weeks. Anywhere in there, I can do it. Well, your puppy falls right in there. It's 15 weeks. And now your puppy's afraid of the collar. Well, that's not what we intend. And that's not what we want. We want the dogs to be bold and confident and ready for the training by following the groundwork, following the, you know, prerequisite steps to get there, and then being able to evaluate and read your puppy for yourself. Um, We can't get our eyes on every single dog, and that is where that Patreon community comes in, where we can visually see through these video exchanges your training sessions, and we could say, hey, whoa, 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 your puppy's not ready for collar conditioning. They seem a little, you know, timid, or just they need a little more socialization, or you did throw that collar on, had that bad training experience and you videoed it and you put it up and you go, what did I do wrong? Why isn't my puppy responding the way some of your puppies in your videos did? And we can say, we can definitely give you direct feedback. What we saw that happened. Yep. So again, that's patreon.com slash standing stone kennels. You can sign up there to be able to get direct feedback from us. Now there is a question that often gets asked, you know, do I get anything additional with this or where is my plan or where are the extra videos or anything? And I want to be clear with this really fast that that specific platform is there for you to be able to ask us questions, especially if we don't get to your questions here. You want answers, you can reach out to us there. Um, And with your specific training situations via video responses, you can um, show us what's going on and we can give you direct feedback on your sessions. So this is a really great question as well. And I definitely want to hit on it about e-callers. It says... There's a lot of controversy behind e-collars. What are the pros and cons of using one from Lan Crawshaw on Instagram? And I think we've kind of been talking about those a little bit right now about the pros and cons. Um, The pros are that you're definitely going to be able to reinforce all of your obedience-based training. Um, It is a, you know, depending on the model of e-collar you have, some of them have a two-mile range. That's a two-mile leash, basically, that you have attached to your dog for safety and to be able to make sure that your dog's not going to run off and get into a potentially dangerous situation, whether that's crossing a road, chasing a deer, and getting lost. Um, All of these things that could happen when your dog isn't on a lead with you. And I think that if you think of an e-collar on the good side as a continuation of a leash, I mean, think about if you really jerked hard on a dog and really pulled hard with a leash and a flat collar, you can hurt them. And just like if you really hit them with an e-collar, you can also hurt them. So any dog any training tool, tool used, used absolutely. Is so if you think of the e-collar like you are continuing it from a leash and just use it in moderation, use it correctly, use it with something that they already are fully aware of, know how to do, then you can be done. It can it can be that long, it can be replaced that long leash. It can be a two mile leash. So my um, argument for, or however you want to say this exactly, um, in the way that I would bring it up to different dog trainers and different dog enthusiasts and everything is, uh, I think that very few people could argue with the fact that timing is one of the most important things um, in order to develop and train a new dog. Timing is the key to that, which is why we specifically use clickers and all of our positive reinforcement training um, because that allows you to mark specific timing and it sound exactly the same, be exactly the same for each time. But that timing is allowed to be extended into your collar conditioning training and more advanced training by having the button. You can push that and it happens there. 
if the dog makes a mistake when you get into some of this more advanced stuff where they are at a distance or they're out in the field or whatever, that timing is completely lost. Other than your verbal correction that you can have good timing on. Um, but may again, not mean it may not mean enough. When I'd go as far as to say timing is the most important thing. Yes. It yeah, can, I it, would agree with you. It can change. What would be more important than timing? I can't think of anything. We'll come back to that. If we think of something that would be more important than timing in dog training. What do you all think? Throw it in the comments below. If you think there's something that's more important in your dog training sessions and, and in dog training in general than the timing, timing and everything. And in, for, for an example that um, to show how important timing is and the power of timing with clicker training, you can go to mark something. And if you are off with your timing just a little bit, and, and let's say the dog is going to sit. They or load the dog a lot is, of times. So puppies will load where they like look like their butt's about to hit the ground, but they're actually loading it, to launch at you. And, and the timing ends up being that you mark them on the way up, or you mark them doing a specific paw flip, or you mark them doing anything. That timing is what they saw, and that's what you're going to see repeated. So... Timing. Timing is so important, and the e-collar is a super powerful tool to be able to make sure that your timing is correct in all of your yeah. training. So getting back to just finishing up that question about and the cons of using one, I think the cons of using one are improper introductions and just improperly using them overall. Uh, they are such a powerful training tool, but if they're not introduced properly, working on conditioning and then proofing that collar as well as you know, working through any startling reactions that you get with your puppies at the beginning of those introductions um, is where your cons are going to come in just because you haven't been using it right. To be a, to play a little bit of a devil's advocate, maybe as far as the cons go of having any color would be um, some people, I think, say that they, that they would end up becoming reliant on the collar and they have to always have the collar in order for their dog to, reply, to respond to what they're asking or to do what they're saying. And I believe that um, if you, again, aren't doing your training properly, that's going to end up being the case. Um, and, and I think that that becomes wrapped up around improper use in general. Yep. A con of an e-collar would be improperly using the e-collar because I hear all the time, all the time. I never even have to charge a transmitter. I never even have to turn the I collar on. I don't even push the button. I just throw it on them and they're so much better behaved. Well, that's because you have a dog that is quote unquote collar wise and collar wise is not fixed by the dog wearing the collar for X amount of time before you ever push the button. Collar wise is built by not using the collar properly when the collar needs to be used and not having realistic expectations of the dog or following through with what you're asking. Timing. So, timing. That, that this is wrapped right back into timing. Yep. So, I think this is a good one because Annie's been pretty quiet. Oh, great. So we're gonna we're gonna all let Annie answer this one because <laughs> it's a good one for you. From Maximus Prime thirty seven on Instagram. Maximus Prime. How do you tell when a dog is ready for e collar introduction for the come here command? Well, I would say if you've done your positive reinforcement, say with your clicker training, once they've gotten that down. Um, for us, we usually do it, it's hard to do with one person in the beginning with puppies, so we are usually doing it together. Um, once they start anticipating, you get to kind of play tricks with the puppy and call them back when they're automatically going back to say, Charles, we'll call them back to us. Um, like we stated earlier, we usually do it around 14 to 16 weeks, but it all depends on the puppy. I mean, there's some puppies at 14 weeks where you just have to put the e-collar on them and let them just get used to it on them because they've not had it before. Um, but for us, as long as they're responding to the clicker training and the command that you choose, we use here, um, that's usually when we'll put the collar on and start using vibrate and just incorporate basically that same process from the clicker training um, into the collar conditioning. Very short sessions, and you always want to end on a positive note is kind of where we – Land. Yeah, we make sure that they fully understand what we're asking them to yeah. do before yeah, we ever. Yeah, the clicker training solid in those controlled environments. Yeah. I typically use as like one of my benchmarks is that clicker training is solid in those controlled environments inside the house when I've got their focus. But when we start going outside for potty breaks and things like that, and they start 
ignoring me. You start to see that boldness and independence. Quite a bit of independence. Where yeah. they're like, Meh, yeah. I think I'm just going to go run over to these bushes or, uh, I, I think the homing pigeons calling. are way cooler than you. So yeah, I'm going to just ignore you, Go check mom. out the pond. <laughs> There's yeah. usually something, and you're like, oh, it's time for a collar conditioning. Exactly. It's that boldness, that independence starts showing itself, and you go, well, you're not listening in these uncontrolled in situations anymore, but you're really solid when we've got a controlled training you know, session going on. Now we need to be able to transition so that I can have a good recall response in these more distracting situations. So, And that's different for every single dog. Yeah. Absolutely. Sometimes we've got a 12-week-old puppy that is just bold, confident, super independent, and starting to just wander off. And I'm like, well, we can't have this now, can we? And then I've still got some puppies that are glued to my side when we're outside at 16 weeks. Sprig was well, a great example I was going to say, that, that changes based on breed and personality. Yep. I mean, I don't think we started Sprig's collar condition until he was almost six, seven months old. Yeah, he was very cooperative. Um, or not a typical super- short hair, a more independent dog by nature. Um, we're usually starting. And how, that's how they're bred. You know, yeah. they're, that's what they're, that's what they're looking supposed for. to be independent. Exactly. Yep. So those were some really great questions. I think that that's about all we have time for in this episode. So thanks for asking these questions. Like I said, we had a very strong theme on e-callers this time. So we wanted to get to as many of those as we could. Thanks guys for watching. We will be back with part three here shortly. I'm the guy with the pink gun. I'm Kat, the dog trainer. I'm Annie. And I'm Charles. Push one of your buttons. A good one. Uh, oh, so lovely. Angels. <laughs>